I'm Richard Porter. I'm Johnny Smith. And this is Smith & Sniff, a podcast in which two friends talk about cars and many other things. I woke up uh, with a quandary, which I don't know the answer to. <laughs> like, it sounds like intellectual country music. I woke up with a quandary. I woke up with an existential question. That's right. Um, now, Jean-Michael Jarre. <laughs> O- oxygen, ox- oxygen, yeah? Mm-mm-mm. Yeah. Shouldn't have taken a mouthful of coffee then. Uh, um, yeah. So Jean-Michael Jarre, oxygen. Jo- no, wait, wait. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? No, this is my quandary. Jean-Michael Jarre. Jean-Michel Jarre, sorry. Jean- <laughs> no, no, but I just like the idea that you refuse to, to use his French version. If you're French, you can say that, but come on, yeah. or British, so it's oh, Jean-Michael. Hey. Oh, Jean-Michael, Jean-Michael Jarre, Jarre o- off of oxygen, Yeah. Oxygen. Okay, oxygen. Yeah. Has it had more parts, more remixes, as it were, than Lamborghini Aventador Special Editions? Which ones had the most versions of? Well. I I thought about this. I mean, oxygen's... I mean, I don't know if he's done anything other than oxygen. I think he just keeps regurgitating another oxygen. I mean, it's a salutary lesson, really. If you Isn't just it? come up with one good keyboard part, and then uh, you can just—I mean, I was going to say—I think go probably to his concert, frankly. No, uh, younger listeners won't have any idea what we're talking about. <laughs> but just look up Jean Michel. Jean. You go to a John Michael Jar concert, and he doesn't do Oxygen all the way through. And then mm. he's going, oh, I wonder what the encore is going to be. It's like a silent disco. <laughs> yeah, yeah it would just be. Well, what what else does? Does he do? I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm bit... going to say, for Frenchness, apart from anything else, that Oxygen is mm. the Citroen AX of tracks Boo-boo-boo-boo. in terms of the number of special editions or slash remixes that have been done. But I think, would it be fair to say that the only song that's had more remixes and re-releases is You've Got the Love by The Source featuring Candy Staten? Um, yeah, I feel like that has been. It's like it's sort of almost like a tradition. Every year that song gets re-released in a slightly different version, just for old time's sake. And it's That's still right. great. It is. Well, it's I, still I, a great song. It was one of the first CDs that I bought. Actually, was, was, it? It was yeah, it was yeah. Little did I. I mean, CD I knew it, single. Yeah, I knew it was an anthem then, but I didn't realise it would still be so highly regarded even now. I mean, uh, it was to me. It was it was even Stevens with. Um, let me be a fantasy by Baby D. I'd still maintain mm. they're both as good as one another. They just Ooh. go on. Listen, listen to listen to Baby D at some point today, and uh, tell me what you think. Um, off of like, let me be your fantasy and all that. <laughs> let me I be. Think, though, let me be. That song would only sound good or right out of an aftermarket stereo system in a 90s warm That's hatchback. It'd be an Astra. Um, it's going to be ah. an Astra. It's going to be an Astra. Um, well, I've, been, I've heard it a few times in GTEs, but it, yeah. I, I'd, I'd go, I'd settle for an SRI. Ideally, I'd like a GSI. I think it'd be an Astra GSI co- uh, track that would be for me. Quite like I'm that. sure I once read, you know, the album Kick by In Excess? Yes. It's a very good album. And it's a, a very a, good a sort album. Of a quintessential album of its era the sort of mid to late 80s. Um, I'm sure I read somewhere that the original, when that was released, it had been mastered to sound at its best when listened to in a convertible car. Well, that wouldn't... Probably off tape. That wouldn't sur- that wouldn't surprise me. The production on all of the tracks on that album are brilliant. Mm. Uh, I, it's one of those ones I quite like listening to with my home stereo separates, which are now woefully out of date. But but it being, being such a dad, I still go, yeah, they're good. They're good. They've still got it. Yeah, <sighs> the, the thrill of talking about hi-fi separates. I know that's, nobody, that's does. Lost art, nobody, nobody does. does nobody does. Nobody does. What's your? Uh, what, you got you got the old Nakamichi tape deck there, have you? That's nice. Nice bit of kit. What kind of you got? Cambridge Audio. Oh, oh sweet, yeah. sweet. Is it? But I, I don't know whether it's is it frowned upon now or just nobody cares. Is it the sort of jeans and shoes of the um, audio world talking about separates? Hi- In fact, oh. some, I talked about having a hi fi a few <laughs> years ago, and some guy just went, "Do you actually call it a hi fi still?" 
And I went, ooh, I don't know. I never even, <laughs> never, never even questioned it. Of course it's a hi-fi. Uh, uh, oh, well, well, and then I felt very small and insignificant for a while. But, but those, I think there is a still, because of the resurgence in vinyl and the sort of, you know, format nerds who insist that vinyl sounds better and they're probably talking bollocks, but yeah. the, they will have one of those extremely complicated amps that's got little, like, glass domes on it with valves. Oh, valve, valve amp. I'd love a valve Made by a tiny company in Suffolk, and it costs nine grand or something. Well, you know that I've got a valve amp um, head unit for a car, don't you? No. Oh, Richard. I've, <laughs> I, I've, I've been looking for one for a long time. They were made by Panasonic. Um, yeah, they are beautiful. And how, and how how big is it? Well, it's a double din. Uh-huh. It's double din, and uh, it was it was obviously very Japanese market focused. But you can buy a, a domestic mm. market version which ends in a D, or a W market one which is worldwide. And I found mm. myself a worldwide version. I bought it during lockdown from. Uh, <laughs> it came from Lithuania, I think. Uh, really? Yeah, because the prices of them have gone a bit silly, and I always wanted one. I always thought I'm going. I think I'm going to put it in my um, taxi in the the Tokyo taxi because I just think it'll be the best. But yeah, it's called. Um, in fact, I've got, I've got to look it up now because I used to know the the serial number off by heart, but I've I've now got other things in my life. So, uh, <laughs> but does it? So have you ever had a chance to to listen to it in person? No, not yet. No, because I wonder what it sounds like. I it's, if it's, it's good. If it's well, nice it's still warm. well. It's still supposed to be. Here we go. It's the um, the Panasonic CQ dash TX five fifty, um, and then it's either a W or a D, depending. So it's it's early MP three CD mm-hmm. player, and it's got vacuum tubes. They call it. It's a vacuum. It, uh, it, honestly, if you're into in car entertainment. Or you like mm. the aesthetics of just unusual radios and things? It's mm. it's up there, man. It's got needle. It's got needle needle. Um, uh, you know, needle dials for levels. I think I might have seen this. Yes. Yeah, I reckon uh, I've shown you before because I've been probably. obsessed with them. I first encountered one. They used to sometimes come in on grey import, like Mazda MX fives and stuff. And from that moment on, I was like, I need to be involved in this. This is amazing. <laughs> um, so, uh, good. Okay. So, yeah, I've got one. I've got one. That's nice. Um, since you mentioned, mentioned Lithuania, I said last week I would read out an email from um, a, a chap called Augustus, who is a listener in Lithuania, and wrote to us about Lithuanian car culture, of which I knew nothing. Um, Augustus says, I'm Lithu- Lithuanian, which means we don't often get mentioned in the world of cars, but we are a very car centric nation. There's a massive amount of auto events here from national touring car racing to classic car rallies. We have a successful Dakar rally team and rally enthusiasts turn full-scale engineers building suspensions and gearboxes for WRC cars. Wow. I think countries like Lithuania are often looked down as a wasteland for old diesel German cars, but it is slowly changing. <laughs> we have a strangely large amount of Citroen CXs and VW T1 buses here. A huge Pontiac Transport Owners Club. What? That's- those are those people carriers that look sort of like a dust buster, aren't they? Yeah, they are. They do look like a vacuum cleaner. Yeah. That's, what? There's a community of them over there. He says really? a huge plenty of transport owners club. He Why? also says lots of dedicated and insanely knowledgeable Saab and Opel enthusiasts, as well as lots of other manufacturers' cars. Um, I feel like I need to go there. Well, yeah. So he says the love for cars in our country was always greatly driven by what happened after 1990. It was a magical period when all the Soviet built and mostly undrivable misery was replaced with Japanese and German cars imported by car merchants, a very popular and extremely dangerous occupation at the time. It's something not every country gets to experience. But for Lithuanian car enthusiasts, the 90s was an amazing decade when not just children, but grown adults finally got to see their first ever proper car. A Mark 1 Golf, a Ford Sierra, Opel Ascona, or an Audi 100, which is almost an unofficial symbol of our freedom, since there were so many of these modern wedge-shaped saloons here. Oh, really? Uh, yeah. That- I've always wanted to share the automotive atmosphere of Lithuania. I realise that the interchange of cars and stories about the Baltic car world during the wild capitalism of the 90s are probably only, only special to us, but I believe it will always be worthy of a segment on a world-renowned car show. 
I'll add two pictures. Now, he sent two pictures. These are brilliant. One of them is of an aero-shaped Audi 100 with the words Hold On Lithuania written on the side in Lithuanian. Hold Taken On? In 1991 during the January events. I so guess someone had a vinyl, um, someone had, someone put some vinyl graphics on it? No, it's just daubed on. Oh, with no. This, this rattle canned on, I think, in black paint. Or Hold On Lithuania. Car. Yeah. And the second picture is, is um, as of a Lotus Omega with a questionably dressed father and son in uh, <laughs> mid nineties Lithuania. It's not actually Augustus, but it's someone who sent it to him. Um, <laughs> he adds, as a PS, Lithuanians almost got to compete in Group B rally in a mid-engined Lada S Proto, built in the capital of Lithuania for the 1987 season. But as you know, Group Band, Group B was a band. So, um, a mid-engined Lada, that sounds fascinating. The picture, I'll put these two pictures up for our uh, patrons, but um, the, the picture of the guy with his son and the Lotus uh, Carlton Omega, it's got a, a Citroen BX and an Audi 80 in the background. The BX has got a, the aftermarket. Do you ever remember the BXs? You could get an aftermarket panel that went around the number plate between the back lights that was red, so it sort I of do. matched the back lights. So it looked like an extra large reflector. Or was it an extra large reflector? It was for people who had a BX but sort of wished they had a Rover 800. And uh, and so you could fill in the back. There were a couple of fill-in reflector panels that were available. They sometimes had the name of the car in the reflector. Yes. I remember seeing this. this, It's coming back to me. Anyway, I just thought I'd read that out because, A, it's really nice to know we've got at least a listener in Lithuania and that Lithuanian car culture. Because if you'd said, name countries around the world that are really into their cars and they've got a big scene going on, just Lithuania wouldn't, I think, pop to mind. And yet, yeah. we're wrong. And I like the fact that Aero Audi 100 was a sort of a symbol of freedom. I do as well. That's brilliant. And with the hold on Lithuania on the side. That's... Mm. Wow. Well, thanks very oh. much. And hello to anyone else from Lithuania who listens to this dreadful podcast. <laughs> and what are you thinking? <laughs> Go and... Uh... <laughs> I'm going to have to look, see if I can find the Lithuanian car podcast chart and see if we figure in there, because we, we, we I miss it. about saying that we're Britain's number one car podcast. But if we could claim to be Lithuania's number one car podcast, I think we're really good. Oh, we, could, we could get other stickers made, couldn't we? Get yeah. Stickers <laughs> made. <laughs> yeah well, Augustus could help us with the Lithuanian to, to write it in the correct language. Well, maybe but, we'll um, get an aero-shaped Audi and I can rattle can oh. some advertising onto it. <laughs> Rattle canned advertising is always a sign of a high class establishment, isn't, isn't it? it? It's, it's, it it's full is. potatoes next left. <laughs> I always feel sorry for vehicles which are just used as a as a bracket for a sign. So they're parked yes. at the side of the road. They're always getting completely like they've got dirt and dust thrown at them all day and all night, and it's just like a sorry little pickup van or i've seen a lot of ford ka's used to do that and smarts in london were popular because of their small stature and they just sit there they're just waiting to be vandalized aren't they Mm. it's such a shame they're just a sitting duck nobody cares about them and they they're fully expected to start up and move a very short distance once every month and that's about it I feel really um, sorry for them. I'd like to save one. A bit like, you know, when people claim battery hens after they've been in the battery farm. And they give they? them this... N- yeah, yeah, there's a whole charity that rehomes ex-battery hens. I know friends of mine have, have got, you know, have claimed dozens of them. Basically oh, giving God. them a nice life after, you know, horrific I've, circumstances. Uh, God, forgive my ignorance. I, th- I sort of assumed that battery hens just sort of... They were died. made to lay eggs until they died, and then they were thrown away. I didn't think they do. They do, do hens stop laying at some point? Now they sort of they do. I, th- I think they do stop a laying. Menopause. Yeah, I think they do stop laying, but also I get they get very tired because they get overworked in an oh, okay. abnormal time frame. Yeah. So and and again, intelligent listeners will correct us if we're wrong here. But uh, yeah, so mm. what they do is they give them a retirement, like like donkeys that people used to, uh, or they still do claim donkeys after they've been used to walk up and down Scarborough Beach for seventy years. They, yeah, they let them just go and chill out in a field somewhere nice that's nowhere <laughs> near ice Greyhound. creams and shouting yeah. children, <laughs> candy floss. Yeah, so, so the donkey. The, the good thing about those, the donkey's complexion really cleans up because it's not eating discarded ice cream and candy floss anymore. That's so. true. So, yeah, yeah. Gr- Gritty, gritty ice cream, like a ninety-nine <laughs> plate that's instantly just been tossed onto the yeah. onto the sand. It's like wet and dry. 
paper, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> he ends up. I was thinking about this the other day. I was writing a script where the, the word gritty was being used in a slightly tongue-in-cheek way, and I was suddenly thinking uh, that there's nothing worse than gritty food, is there? It's horrible. It is awful. It's really That's why you awful. shouldn't eat on a beach. No, it's um, certainly on the East Coast, I find I've, I've been caught in a couple of little sort of blustery moments where if you're sitting down, you're obviously at the eye level of uh, sand moving <laughs> and it's not great. It sort of ruins the moment, I find. Uh, oh, I know something I was going to ask as well. Um, I know a few weeks ago, whatever it was, we were talking about caffeine and machine. Well, yes. Do you remember, you know, I... I, we, we, I, I I'm quite keen on a good piss fister, aren't mm. I? Uh, nice mm. place to stop the car and have a sort of rural nature wee with a view. Mm. Um, I was thinking, imagine if they were to set up a, a competing venture called um, maybe like Ravine and Latrine. <laughs> so it would be, <laughs> it would be a great place to stop, look at the view and everything, relieve, yeah. relieve yourself yeah. in, 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 in re- relative pr- privacy and then off you go <laughs> yes yeah ravine and latrine so uh, i don't know if that's going to come i'll have to ask the owners of cafe and machine because they are setting up another one aren't they they're setting up a are they yeah they're doing one in the um i think it's near the peak district or it's in the peak district yeah oh so that's, I, I didn't know that well that's a fact and that's free advertising for cafe and machine yeah dan yeah phil take that <laughs> <laughs> not, not. I was about to say you can give me a free coffee next time I turn up. Well, they actually did the last time I turned up, so it's actually fine. Um, well, that's, that's great. Yeah, piss fisters. It's the future. Good. I, it, yeah. Well, when I mean, was the last time you had one? I had a fantastic one last week. Uh, I do you have one on the way down hmm. to Goodwood when we were filming at Goodwood? I didn't. No, uh, I stopped. Call me, call me a square, but I stopped at a at a. The garage and use the lavatories there. Oh no, um, that's a wasted, wasted venture. Yeah, it was a nice drive actually to Goodwood the other week from from where we are now across the south of England. A uh, bit of bit of the country I don't really know. We're across Wiltshire and things, and it was all very pretty. Nice that, evening. And that is, is it? Would you do it at dusk as well? If it is it, it dusk, was, it was yeah, pre dusk. It was sort of you know uh, late evening. I was I did mine at down. dusk, and I did manage to find a really good place to stop. Um, f- for for the toilet for a number one just as the sun was it really shallow and I, f- I feel like it it was one of those moments where you really needed Jan Hammer playing Crockett's mm. theme it would have worked brilliantly albeit I'm in a Kia EV6 not any kind of Ferrari and I, we I'm, didn't talk in our post Goodwood show about uh, our arrival at <laughs> the Goodwood site on the Wednesday evening and how yeah, I drove around for about what felt like about five hours trying to find the gate I'd been told to go in at, yes. which cost me a thousand pounds in fuel because I was in my Range Rover, and <laughs> and then ended up. I just I just gave just, up and I was like, I'm going to turn into what was labelled Gate Two. I'll, I'll turn in here and I'll just I'd been told to go to Gate Three. I couldn't find Gate Three. Turn into Gate Two just to ask someone where it was, and Gate Two is the bottom of Goodwood like Lord Sir March's driveway. It's uh, the hill. It's the it's the track, effectively, during that weekend. And I drove onto it, and I stopped. There was no one there. I remember you saying this. You, fo- you phoned me and went, this is incredible. I've just gone straight in, no issues. And I was 10 well, I was minutes behind it, you. I, like, I could see the start line. I thought, there's nobody... Nobody can stop me. And so I just drove up the thing. And I was, I was like, I'm driving up Goodwood Hill. Here I go. I'm driving. And I thought, I could just drive to the top. But I didn't because I was worried about getting told off and thrown out and then we wouldn't be able to do our stuff. So, um, But I just turned off near the house to where we were supposed to be going. But then you were ringing me and you were having the same thing of just orbiting the countryside. Trying yeah. to find in the pitch dark by then. The pits were dark. And I, I went. I basically went in through the outdoor and I got, I got, I got, I got up to, I got up to the start line, the actual Goodwood start line, and there were some chaps there with high vis on and with a like a, yeah, a Ford Ranger with flashing LEDs on it, and they said, "Oh, um, we've just had to stop it actually because they're about to do the the practice with the drift cars and the fireworks." So I was like, "Well, I don't feel like I'm, I'm ready to enter that, so I'm gonna." I'll turn around and go another way, and as I did, I got stuck in just a monumental queue of 
tradesmen's vans trying to get in who were all irate because they had to they oh, delivered yes. everything they needed to deliver that day apart from one paper clip which they just popped back to to give to somebody <laughs> and they couldn't because they closed the track for drifting and fireworkings mm. so uh yeah i you you got in really easily i sat for about 45 minutes well i got in really i couldn't even see the drift cars driven around sussex for a Clash afternoon, evening um, uh, we're supposed to, I just realised we're supposed to be doing readers' letters or listeners' letters, aren't we? Aren't we? Did we yes. promise to read more out? Uh, we did, and um, the uh, well, <laughs> I'm glad you said that. I'd, I'd saved the one from Augustus in Lithuania. That was a good one. Um, I like Augustus. And, uh, oh, hey, no, I tell you what. Well, bear with me, caller. Uh, yeah, because here we here's a this is an interesting one. This is from a, a, a patron called Hector Lane. Um, he says you've got fifteen hundred pounds to buy a practical family car, and another thousand pounds to set it up as you like. What are you choosing? Mm. Now the question confused me. Why would you not just spend two and a half grand on a decent car rather than? Because I'm thinking aftermarket add-ons, which will yeah improve the well-being of said vehicle. Um, but. Well, I think Chris Harris said it really well when I posed the same question to him, and I did it to to Harry when I was doing the brown chair chat on mm. on on the late break show. And I think Harry opted for um, a Volvo eight fifty in the end. Um, yeah. That was high. He was prepared to take high mileage in in, in <laughs> as long as it was comfortable and up together. Yeah. Oh, they're built for it, though, aren't they? The mileage that's okay. Yeah, yeah. they're okay. They can cope. And very ergonomic mm. seats, which we both agreed that that was where your money was going. Mm. Um, my parents agree because they had a they had an eight hundred and fifty T five, um, and whereas Monkey Harris, I'm with him on this one. He said, "Look, if I had to get rid of everything, I'd get a first generation Ford Focus that wasn't too bad, and I would just put my money into new bushes and new dampers and tires." Yes. And I actually yes. think that if you bought a five, say you got a family like we have and Monkey has, I could get a five door Focus. You could even mm. get a gear, possibly. Oh, but they've got that horrible fake wood on the dashboard. Oh, you'd have to you'd have to cleaver meat cleaver that off, wouldn't you? <laughs> yeah, I just go Z Tech. Yeah, Z Tech. All right, Z Tech five door with with just normal loys. Um, I, well, I've got to take the, the the tires off anyway to replace it with de- decent tires. So I would. I put mm. some good. I put some half decent, you know, Contis or Michelins or Pirellis on it. I'd get mm. some really nice dampers <laughs> on it. I'd get it poly bushed possibly, um, and I'd probably rust proof it just because I'm that kind of guy. And if you're taking the rear subframe and stuff off, you might as well do it. That would be really good. That would. They've, they always have shiny gear knobs because you know they wear shiny. Always, so yeah. I would probably de sheen the knob, <laughs> and then <laughs> and the steering wheel would look like a would look like an ice rink. So I'd probably again I'd ruffle the steering wheel up a little bit, or even yeah. trap tre- myself, mate. Trap myself. A little bit of Al- Alcantara on the wheel. Speak to my Ooh. friend, someone like Craig Hughes, the upholsterer, who did that amazing job on my Allegro interior, and said, "Could you, if I took the steering wheel off, Craig, could you do a little bit of Alan Cantara around the edge?" Mm. I reckon that would work, wouldn't it? Yeah, I can't. I can't think of it. I mean, I, the only thing is, as your if your children are of a certain size, and you know, we have a dog as well, I might go Mondeo. Mark yes three Mark two Mondeo two two, two for fifteen hundred two sheets. if you're counting yeah. The sort of not the so not the original and not the headlight big headlight facelift of that, but then the one after the one where it's sort of trying to look a bit like a Passat um, estate, perhaps. Yeah, and I think that's a great again, idea. just go through the chassis, replacing the dampers and the bushes so that it drives the way it should. Mm. Would you even go Jag X type estate? Um, because nobody they, really wants it. Yes, them. no, it's true. They well, the four wheel drive ones get a bit troublesome, don't they? With the with this, this, this some this too, in too the many shafts. Drive system. Too many shafts. And the diesel was a bit bland. I, but the 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 basic V six, the two point one liter V six, which was front wheel drive only. I remember being quite a surprisingly pleasant car. There you go. That could be it. But you'd have you got to feed it. 
I know yeah. that's not well, that's not being entered into this equation. You've got to feed them. Yeah. You've got to tax <laughs> and feed it. I was going to say that is probably sort of quite for its for its size and performance. It's probably quite a thirsty car. So yeah. I might just stick with the the Mondeo. I don't know what else could you do fifteen hundred for a practical car. Well, um, it doesn't about if if size wasn't so important or you genuinely didn't want a larger car. Um, I've just helped my nephew buy one, his, his very first car. I've just found him quite a well-worshipped um, K11 Micra. Ah. And I'm really excited about it. I'm actually more excited about it than he is, I think. It's taken me Not- about a year to persuade him to get a one-litre 16-valve Micra as his first car because at first he was like, no, I'm not having any of that. I'm getting a Clio or I'm getting a Corsa. And I said, no, 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 you just don't bother. Get a get a twenty year old dead person's micro, and sure enough, this one's got fifty eight thousand miles. It's got all the history, two keys. It's that vivid blue colour, um, and sh- sure enough, the two previous owners have died. So it's textbook deceased vehicle, um, <laughs> and it's and it was nine hundred and fifty quid, and the MOT had been done the week before we bought it, and you're like. How, you can't get a better first car than that. If you wanted something that you can afford to insure, that's easy to repair, it won't go wrong anyway, so you won't ever need to repair it. And they look good. Yeah. They look good actually. Lowered. They, they. You can again. You can buy some decent damping for them, and they look good on little little rims. So that's what he's going for. So a K11 Micra. It's your, it's your just eat favourite, isn't it? Yeah, yes, it is. They go, they're a bit rotty though, aren't they? That's the. the they can issue. get a little bit careful. frilly on the back where the sill meets the back arch. That usual place there. Yeah, this one's good mm. though. I have to say, really yeah. good. Yeah. See, I'd always go if you wanted a small Japanese car of sort of that era. I would, I'd, I'd go towards Yaris, but maybe. You'd favour Yarai over K11. I don't know, but then the, the you know the Nissan. They've got that's lovely little engine in those Nissans, isn't it? Nice yeah. little revy little, you know, oh, twin the, cam, oh, the 16 gorgeous. gorgeous, gorgeous, and, if, and you've, be, oh. if you've looked at the price of of, um, of consumable parts for them, it's, they're laughably cheap. It's just brilliant, really. Yeah, and that's the future. You know, that's that. that I said to him, "You can maintain that car yourself." We can do stuff on that car. It will it will owe you hardly anything, and as long as you don't crash it, it will be very very resilient. So, do you know what's really delightful about very small cars and very skinny wheels is when you need new tires and they're like thirty five quid each or something for for actual brand name tires. Oh, kind of go hundred percent. That's a pleasant surprise. It's a wonderful surprise, isn't it? It's a wonderful surprise. My my, my I always uh, remember my brother being furious at the fact that we were. I think we were going to a scrapyard one day. This was ages ago when we were like, I don't know, 18, 17. And there was a bloke rummaging around the scrapyard and he'd gone in there to buy spark plugs, tyres and exhausts or to put on his own car. My brother was like, you're going into a scrapyard to buy spark plugs. I mean, like, what? On, I mean, your life is just worthless. <laughs> so I, think that, I think those are the words that he might have used. Um, but he, and, and he was taking an exhaust off a car to put on his car. It's like, my brother was like, by the time you've yeah. taken that exhaust off, assuming you've managed to get it off without cutting it off, because it will have been, they don't like to last. Um, he said, again, it's just like, what are you doing? Just don't bother. But there are some good... There's some brilliant parts on second-hand cars, cars which have been limped through the last two MOTs, let's say, and they've had a couple mm. of new parts put on them, and then the person's finally given up. They've gone, oh, another thing's gone wrong. I give up. So you'd sometimes see a car on top of a stack with a brand-new exhaust, really shiny, or a pair of really brand-new tyres. I think that's what worries me about MO. I know it's a bit sensible, this conversation now, but I think that's what worries me about MOT-exempt cars. You can buy yeah. a 1982, we could buy a, a really badly treated 1982 Vauxhall Chevette now. And if you were running it on a shoestring and or you were clueless as to maintenance, you could put a pair of tyres on it, which just looked like licorice all sorts. Um, yeah. you, you'd, you'd, you'd know that the wheel cylinders at the back are leaking, but you can't be asked to spend 12 quid each, which is what they are. So you just drive it yeah. anyway. The police aren't going to pull you over unless it looks really hanging. And you can possibly have full brake failure and, and cause a catastrophic accident. All for what? For a 40 quid MOT? And the fact that, really, some you should have a second opinion looking over that car. 
really. Yes. I think. Yeah. And that's mm. coming from someone that loves old cars. But I think it's just a false economy, really. really. I mean, a few uh, people do sort of voluntarily MOT their old cars, don't they, just to make sure. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I mean, yeah. actually, you don't have to have an official MOT. This is some real consumer information for Smith & Sniff listeners. <laughs> yeah, what's what you can on? do is you can just book your car in to, a, a, let's say, a friendly garage, a person you know who runs a garage, has got a ramp, who does possibly do MOTs, and just say, can I have a pre-MOT check? And basically, mm. you'll pay them for an hour of their labor. They'll use the ramp. They'll use the – even they'll use the emissions prong, if you want that – and they'll do a, the equivalent of an MOT, but afterwards they might go, you might want to have a look at that, or that bearing is starting to wear, or I'd keep an eye on that tyre there, that's the last year of this tyre. And I like having that. You, you get yourself mm. a little reference sheet to go, right, before the end of the summer I'm going to buy a pair of tyres for the back, I'm definitely going to order a, a new this, a new that, my radiator's looking a little bit sad. just helps. And also, yeah. nobody wants to break down. You don't want to go out in your classic car or your, you know, your your seldom used sports car and have a have a really shit journey because <laughs> then it's not very enjoyable. <laughs> no. Or do you? Is that what day. you want, I, Richard? Is that is that what you're looking for? No, I don't. I hate breaking down. That's the thing. That's why I don't have an old car. Well, you know, a really old car. Are you scared? Is I just, I just don't find it enjoyable. Yeah. I know some people sort of they sort of do in a way that the sort of the tinkering and the fettling is part of the the pleasure of the having the car, and for me yeah. it's just a nuisance. I'm just not. I think partly because I'm aware of my own limitations. Yes. in that area, and I don't want to be a bodge merchant, and I just I, I, it doesn't it doesn't bring me satisfaction. I mean, obviously, it's massively satisfying when you fix something. Um, yeah, but I can see I, that. I had this. We um, we sort of doing things to our new house and I had this grand plan that I was going to do up the room that I'm using as my office um, and take the carpet out because it's a bit tatty and then sand the floor and then but the floorboards are a bit gappy so I've got to do that thing where you get little bits of wood and just put them you know in the the gaps to seal it up and then I need to uh, just just the, the skirting boards then need to be ad- adjusted to because they're gappy at the bottom you know so I need to do something about that and then paint it all and make it nice and I was suddenly like f- I'm gonna fuck that up I know it sounds simple but I'm gonna do something that's gonna fuck it up and then I'm gonna spend the rest of the time when I sit in my office going that's not right I've ruined it I've ruined that I should have got an expert in to help me with this one but uh, I don't know maybe not because it sounds so simple but I just I've, I, a bitter experience tells me that I'm, I'm quite capable of royally screwing up fairly simple tasks so um I think knowing yeah knowing knowing your limitations is good I do uh, the older I get the more inclined I am to give it a go I think it for some really? people it's the other way yeah yeah the, the older I get the other I'm way. Like, I've seen people do this how hard can it be and don't get me wrong sometimes I regret saying that and and wading yeah. in but other times I go it wasn't that bad and actually next time when the kids are older and they've maybe got their own houses or their own cars or whatever maybe dad will be useful <laughs> that would be a mm. good thing wouldn't it dad in useful yeah. shocker <laughs> well yeah it's difficult for me because my dad was an engineer and a very practical man and he was capable of doing all sorts i mean he did an incredible amount of work on our family house and my brother has inherited that ability and i haven't and it's um but my dad was so good at that kind of stuff that he used to have like f- his friends and friends of our family calling up Typically, it'd be like my mum going, uh, yeah, it's uh, it's Graham on the phone. Uh, he wants if you could go around quite urgently. And it'd be like... He's got his finger in it. He's got his finger in a, in a, main, a, a, a mains cold tap. Yeah. And he needs you to yeah. run. And, uh, and Dad would go and help out and sort things out. And he was he was brilliant at that. And I just... I, I wish I was that person, but I'm not. I just can't... I don't have that kind of brain. So I've, as I've got older... Because my first flat, I bought my first flat. I did loads of work on it badly did you and yeah well i mean say loads of work it wasn't like bringing down you know load bearing walls or anything i was just uh, but but in terms of putting things up and decorating and you know changing light switches and plugs and all this sort of stuff i just sort of just do it whereas now i'd be like oh shit uh i better look up how to do that before i do it because I don't want to screw it up, like, you know, putting in metal light switches because you've got to earth them and things. And it's like, I just... You're not I mean, alone. Listen, you're not alone. I, 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 I used I'm to just not do it without checking with a lot of stuff. 
My brother... Electricity, my, particularly. Yeah, I'm scared of electricity. Uh, I, you kind of should be. Um, mm. my, my brother's inherited the engineering gene and the, the incredible methodical problem-solving gene. He just laughs at my ineptability to just see the logic of what that isn't working because this and this aren't doing what they're supposed to do and he just sees it and i don't see it or or i don't see it immediately might take me a day Mm. or two by which point i'm in tatters um but it it can't be good at everything you're i'm sure you're you're, i'm sure you're good at stuff which your brother's not or maybe not well maybe he's brilliant at everything (laughs) (laughs) He's just a better person than me. But um, the, the, we had a carpenter around the other day. Because um, it is what we... So there's a little bit of banister in our new house that's that's wobbly. Yeah. And it's just a short length of banister, but it was wobbling. Mm. And I was looking at it and I was going, now, where's the... What, it sounds stupid, but I was just like, where's the, where's the weakness here? Pack, What's causing the wobble? Do you pack out the base? It seems to be still attached. Yeah, it's the base. It was the newel post. But we had a carpenter coming around to look at some stuff anyway, so I, and he just went, oh, yeah, yeah, I can fix that for you. And it was actually quite involved what he did. Mm. Um, and, and, and he it required two visits to want to sort of do it and then want to come back and just sort of make good. And um, I love that but, term. I love that I know, term. It's good. <laughs> it just it but, sounds like sort of a pigeon, pigeon-speaking pigeon foreign person where they're, they're – they're, they, they they haven't got the firm grasp of the local lingo, so they just say "make good" and point. <laughs> but yeah, we we now we now use it. It's 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 actually part of the correct language, isn't it? Make, I might, make yeah, good. I might start doing that. We're just like just sort of waving a piece of bread around, going "make good, make good" until someone puts it in the toaster for me. But um, I so I was I was talking to the carpenter, and my wife my wife said, "Oh, actually, why why you're here?" Is there it's just something else that maybe you could come back and do for us? We've got this bloody awful built-in cupboard in the house that we want rid of because it's fucking terrible and broken. And um, but it's 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 huge, and it's obviously been built bespoke but badly. And yeah. then they've sort of put filler in all the bits where they've screwed and nailed it together. So it's going to be a nightmare to pull apart. Uh, and it's yes. got glass doors on it which are quite big and heavy. And I was just like, uh-oh, if I started this with a crowbar, someone's going to get hurt. Yeah. And and so my wife went to the carpenter. She went, look, I know this is probably beneath your skills, but do you think you could just dismantle this for us? And he went, yeah, of course I can do that. And she went, oh, so, oh sorry to ask, because I know, you know, you, you're a highly skilled person. And, and he went, well, yeah, but, you know, you've got jobs. This is my job, doing stuff with things made of wood. So right. you go and do your jobs and then just pay me to do mine. And I was like, what a what a good way of looking at it. It's like if we didn't pay people to do stuff, the economy would collapse. Completely. It's the quickest way to revive the economy is to be shit at something so you have to get someone in to do something. <laughs> I think that's – I think we all know that. We all know that. It's easy. <laughs> Listen, I uh, uh, well, I mean, yeah, it's true though, isn't it? It's true. Yeah, it everyone's is. got to do. So. This. I, I'm definitely when it comes to things that I want done really well on one of my classic cars, like welding. People go, "Why don't you weld mm. your own stuff?" It's like, well, I do know how to weld. I have welded basic things, usually fresh metal, which is a lot easier. Mm. But being able to shape and cut and uh, um, and weld neatly without setting fire to the rest of the car and getting the shapes right i would find that very hard and i would like i will willingly earn money and pay someone else to do this same as painting a yeah. car people who just decide to paint their own car i admire hugely most of the time it doesn't quite work out and it's an no. enormous amount of prep you've got to have the right facilities and i just look at that and go just pay somebody Pay somebody yeah. with a low bake oven, with all the extraction, with all the paint, mm. with all the paint gun and everything. They've already got it all. Just do it. Um, it's funny because a mate of mine's just bought a Series Two Land Rover. It's beautiful from a distance. It looks amazing, and the guy he bought it off had restored it himself. And when you look at some of the work he's done, you go, "This is nice. This is he's done it really well." Even to the extent that, as a final flourish. 
He's had a little plaque made, which is just on the dashboard on the passenger side, that Seriously? says when the car was originally made and then when it was restored. Oh, and, okay. Um, and it's just, and it's really nice, and it looks factory, and it just looks very tasteful. It's, it's not good. like a park and bench plaque where someone had died. No. <laughs> well, it sort of is, but it's just an automotive grade. It's it's good, and there's a lot of it. So there's just lots of little bits of detail. Where you go, this is nice. This is this is very good. But then you look at the paint close up, and you go oh fuck look at this there's like there's runs in it and all bits where it's kind of flat when it shouldn't be and and he was, I was, an, I was like he was an engineer he was an engineer i was like did the guy even paint it himself and my mate just went yeah i'm yeah. gonna have to get this sorted out and it's just this the paint is not it's tricky on cars isn't it paint, but it's it's also if you're a if you're a if you're a bodywork guy you're not an engine guy usually Mm. And if you're an engine yeah. and chassis guy, you don't care about bodywork. There's very yeah. few people that will take it all on and enjoy it all. My brother, for example, he's an engine and chassis and running gear guy. He absolutely will not touch bodywork. Can't stand it. Thinks it's pointless. Mm. Uh, yeah. As long as it doesn't fall off, he's he's cool with it. Um, yeah, it's just that's funny. I was talking to a guy the other day. He's a he's a like a, he's actually another Land Rover specialist. Well, he does all sorts of cars actually, he's, and and uh, he's a mate of a mate. And uh, and he was talking about something he'd been doing. It's very intricate on you know rebuilding an engine and things. And, that. and then and I said, and you do bodywork? And he immediately he went, No, God, don't do bodywork. No, I've got someone. I got, I'll send the cars out for bodywork. Never do bodywork. And he was like, but his immediate like horror Fear. at the suggestion he might do bodywork. Whereas you know he could. He could rebuild an SU carb with his teeth, but just could you could you just you know sort that slight dent? Paint that no, bumper? no, not a chance. Yeah, not a not a chance. Not a I, chance. I see the other day. I saw a, a Fiesta, a black Fiesta, like a sort of two generation old one, and the whole of the front was really shit finish wise. What sort of just semi matte? Semi matte, exactly. And I looked at it and I thought. You know that episode of Father Ted where he gets given that Rover 200 as a raffle prize for the church and then tries to tap a dent out of it and ends up just denting the whole car That's like a golf ball? That's right, yes, yeah. <laughs> I feel like the Fiesta, I was just looking at it going, I bet that started as a scuff on the bumper and you got out the old rattle cans and went, I'll just blend this, I'll just blend it, I'll just, blend, I'll just keep blending, I'll just keep blending, I'll blend, blend, oh no, now the whole oh, front of my car is basically like a blackboard. Oh gosh. Oh. It's horrible. Oh no, uh, we will get on to readers' letters, listeners' letters um, <laughs> at some point. Oh gosh, <laughs> yeah, oh, we know. 40 minutes I mean, in, still we? talking absolute slurry. Um, we were, there was a conversation about automotive tattoos, wasn't there? The other the other podcast. Uh, yeah, a couple yeah, of weeks ago, yeah. I've only ever seen a couple. I mean, I've seen a couple of hot rod ones. You know, like Big Daddy Roth with the rat fink, the huge creature hanging out of a hot rod with the gear stick going out through the roof. That's quite common. But I have seen, and this is niche, a Mark One Granada banger car. So it's. Mm. So it's got race numbers on it, and it's had the front wings clipped and the the bumper removed, and it's got you know like a skip hire firm on the side of it. So it's a- yeah. it's accurate to that person's actual banger car, but mm. most people won't even know it's a four Granada because they kind of you can't tell once you've started taking bits off it, and mm. and that that was a little odd. I thought that was a little bit too niche, but I guess <laughs> the point of tattoos is they're very personal. Um, yeah, and I've also seen a escort rs turbo we we're in white so you know you can get white ink tattoos um and that there was a that was a white car hmm. um very detailed but the proportion was slightly wrong it looked like a seven eighth scale <laughs> didn't quite and i don't know whether it's the stretch the elasticity of the skin that it was being drawn on it just <sighs> looked like seven eighths just seven eighths um, yeah, because I suppose me out. if you have something like, you know, what did, what did everyone have when we were students? Celtic bands, didn't they? Celtic symbols were big. Yeah, you got the, you got the, you had the barbed wire because of thingy. Yeah. Um, what's her name? And From Baywatch. The, yeah. Uh, her, no, her, 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 I wanted to call her Patricia. It's not Patricia, is it? I can't even remember her bloody name. Pamela Anderson. Pam. Pa- Pam Anderson. Pam. Pam, Pam. <laughs> yeah. No, you see, no. Pamela Anderson is the renowned actress and and you know famous person. Pam Anderson sounds like one of your mum's friends when you were growing up. She was the one that you were talking to me about the other day on WhatsApp, who was always happy oh. and, ha- and and a welcoming open house. 
No, that was well, yeah, but because uh, I mean, I WhatsApped you the other day. I've forgotten about that. I was I sent you that message because it suddenly occurred to me you don't get people called Sandy anymore. That's right. The only Sandy growing up that I remember was a man, and I think a man mm, Sandy yeah. is probably rarer than a lady Sandy. But there was who was the newsreader? There was an ITN newsreader called Sandy, wasn't there? Sandy. Can't remember now, but there was one. Yeah, I just think when I sent you a message, I was thinking, Sandy. Well, yeah, Sandy Toxvig. There is a Sandy still. Yeah. Okay. And obviously from Greece, Sandra. Yes, she was Sandy. uh, Olivia Newton John, Mm. wasn't she? But that's the thing, Sandy. It's a it's it's a multi-purpose name. You get men and women called Sandy, but I feel like I haven't encountered a Sandy for a long time. When I was growing up. My parents did have a friend, there was a woman called Sandy, and she was one of those sort of glam mums. I love a glam mum, especially an mm. 80s glam mum. Yeah, well, exactly. Oh, 80s glam mum. So, and I, the first thing I said to you was, I bet <laughs> she had a television in the kitchen. See, that was my gauge. She did. If I went to a friend's house as a kid uh, and you walked in, you walked in the kitchen and there was a TV in the corner, usually with a big dial on it, and yep. a high breakfast bar with some chrome railings. Oh. To me, oh. to me, that was like wow. They've got a serious kitchen. That's incredible. Yeah. And if it was combined, if it was combined with a slightly sort of happy milfy, um, yeah, um, that, well, no. that did aerobics periodically. I'm sure. Oh yeah, Sandy was definitely aerobics. You know, she was wow. full Jane Fonda. Amazing. And she was very. I think she might have been ex cabin crew. Oh, of course she was. Oh, my That's why she was all number. jolly and yeah, because she knew but very glam. Love that and. Um, it is almost certain telly in the kitchen do you ever also you'd be playing at a friend's house and you might go into their parents room and they'd have a telly in their room which you know I mean that was just like oh my god these people are rock stars what's going on yeah yeah but um I I, yeah I I think this Sandy might have had a Toyota Celica at one point which is again very exotic oh my gosh that would have just been the icing on the cake for the 80s mm. in affluent lady yeah oh, well amazing. then her her husband ray ray uh, and sandy he, yeah he bought a jaguar xjs oh my gosh ray head to toe so player yeah. xjs well, he, Jane, she had the celica did she have was that would that have been a 70s celica or an early 80s one an 80s one oh my gosh um, brilliant fantasies but, yeah fantasies it's, it's i mean and also they they had a house built Oh. They had a house built, and when they when it was finished, it, it turned out to be quite open plan, which again in the eighties was mind bogglingly exotic. Mm. It's got an open plan downstairs. <sighs> My God, they're like people from space. I want I want to rewind time and visit Sandy and her um, open plan downstairs. <laughs> you just want to go. To- <laughs> this is a plot of a very low quality movie. Johnny Smith is a man who travels back in time just because he wants to look at eighties glam mum. <laughs> I I do that, man. I'd be there. Well, it's because you'd have a renewed appreciation of them as yeah. an adult, wouldn't you? Oh. Go, oh gosh, they they had it. They kept it all yeah. together. Because. And enjoyed every moment, seemingly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She would have had, you know, in the kitchen, she would have had Howard's Way playing. She would have been, she would have had Howard's Way on while she was loading the dishwasher. But she would, she would have been making up Pavlova at the same time. Uh, but she was in her aerobics gear because she's got to do it quickly. Because yeah. as soon as Howard's Way's <laughs> finished, she's out to do uh, aerobics. Off down to a church hall to do. That's right. So class, she'd be yeah. flailing the Salika down there to or get the right time. Maybe a local leisure centre. I don't know. It but could be a with, a, with a with a with a fun slide. Yeah, a water fun. Because there weren't really gyms, were there? Not in the sense we have them now. Not really. Oh, I don't remember them anyway. Not really. Um, so I've also thought of something else. Yeah. That I, I can't say with certainty that Ray and Sandy had this, but I but I bet they did. And again, something so exotic that it blew my tiny mind as a child in the 80s was people who had a waste disposal oh yes i thought they were dangerous i feared them yeah oh yeah scary yeah quite scary but also it's just a a subtle indicator of wealth yes yeah i i i think you're right it's and what about the, the the tin opener on the wall was there any of that going on did you ever see any of that uh, uh, we had a tin opener on the wall though did you hey hang on a minute yeah. were you 80s affluent people 
Well, no, it's, I don't think they, they were about like four quid or something. <laughs> <laughs> they were like just okay. Yeah, and do right. you know what though? It, it it poked out of the side of the you know the sort of fitted kitchen bit where the oven lived. So it was, um, it, and there was a cupboard next to it, a high level cupboard. So what you had to do the the tin opener, once you'd used it, you then slid it off its bracket, and it was designed to then. You, you put it vertically and slid it back down onto the bracket so it it lay against the wall so the cupboard door wouldn't twat into it. Really? You couldn't leave the oh, you couldn't leave the tin opener on the wall fully in its operational position because it was in the way. Well that just doesn't sound like a solution to me. No. I realise that American listeners are probably going, What well, open plan houses and waste disposals? Like everybody had those in the eighties. What kind of tin pot developing nation did you grow up in? brilliant but it, we did it was britain in the 80s let me tell you listen uh, there we, will be there will be there'll be smith and sniff people um li- listening to this podcast who will know a ray and sandy equivalent from day, mm, days gone oh, by maybe they are they were the ray person. and sandy they could have been the, <laughs> were you the ray and sandy of the 80s <laughs> well i don't know i'm more worried about we every so often we get messages from people going hi i'm uh, yeah i'm only 19 but i love your podcast and those those people those people who for whom the 80s is just we might as well be describing the 16th century i'll just be going what the merry fuck are you talking about now <laughs> you tiresome men <laughs> but on the plus side you know you were saying earlier on about the thing is know your limitations when you're not good at something don't do it yeah. i think this podcast kind of proves that doesn't always have to be the case so oh that's um, true we're not very good at it but we like it it's a bit like me playing but pool. we keep doing it anyway and yeah. as long as no one gets electrocuted that's fine yeah i'm, I'm with you on um that. yeah but anyway um well now i was going to read out i just listen because we did we, oh yes a, a chap called vlad one of our patrons vlad tataranu i hope that's the correct pronunciation that's amazing um Vlad, the fact he's got Vlad in his first name is quite impressive. But um, so Vlad uh, says a quick idea for the show since you asked inconsistencies in cars. For example, the Honda E forgets its drive mode after using cruise control, leading to an inconsistent throttle. Really? You can drive on a hilly road in one pedal mode using regen braking, then use the cruise control for a bit. As you get to a roundabout, you cancel the cruise control only for the Honda to start coasting down the hill, accelerating at rapid pace towards the roundabout while you scramble for the brakes. What? Fun. Yeah. That doesn't sound I, I've right. not driven the Honda E, so I've not experienced it. Have you this, never driven the annoying. E? No. Oh, you must. You must. It's a gorgeous thing. I had a guy pull up to me at the lights in one. Um, it was in London. Yeah, it was in West London. Um, and it was at a dusk time. And I was in the, oh, I was in electric, I was in my Kia EV6, and he wound the window down, he looked across at me and he went, I, I watch your channel, I uh, I really I really enjoy the Honda E, I watched, I watched your review on it and bought one, and then just went, and then right. blew me off at the lights, not like that, <laughs> drove off really quickly, you know what I mean, yeah, it was really good. It's <laughs> good. Um, I've thought of one. Yeah, that's a bit like that. Is the now I can't remember which. I must be the Audi e-tron. Yes, has got. You know, you can adjust the regen. Yeah, but it also has an inverted commas intelligent mode where the car decides how much regen you should get. Is that based? Do you remember this? Is that based upon the Chat Nav? I think it might because be. a lot of them do. Um, a lot of Hyundai's and Kias do it, and Volkswagen Group cars. Oh, yeah, yeah, they, they, a lot of them I've do it. I've not tried it in those. It's quite good. So it knows it's coming up. Is to it a, though? Well, it knows you're coming up to say a hairpin corner. So it will it will put regen up to max rather than if you had it on one out of three, let's say. I think to Vlad's point, inconsistencies. I remember when I tried it in the e-tron, I just, it just annoyed me because when you lifted off the accelerator, you didn't know what you were going to get. Yeah. And I don't like that. I like to know what's coming up. And I like, I wrote a column about this, but I like in our e-up that you can, you've got four levels of regen. And I like titting about with them for the conditions. But I know what I'm going to get because I put it in that particular yeah. mode. I don't want the car to go, now you want four. Now I'm going to give you one. Now nothing. It's just I'm with you. I, it's like it's, we, you're it's, the master of the machine. You don't want mm. you, you're not the puppet. Are you? Exactly. You've been called worse, <laughs> but you're not charge. the puppet. Well, look, back uh, to listeners' letters. Just a quick one from Patreon. This is from a while ago, because yeah. obviously we have a backlog, and we probably <laughs> always will. Um, <laughs> chap called Jeffrey Smith, lovely Patreon chap. He's put, uh, this is regarding my 
controversial comments about air conditioning. This says, a former co-worker of mine had a similar but opposite opinion to Johnny. Immediately, I'm a little bit confused. He refused to use the heater in any of his vehicles. <laughs> he, pre- <laughs> he, pre- he preferred instead to crack a window for ventilation and keep a blanket over his lap. Oh this is God. amazing. Jeffrey Smith. I need to meet this guy. So no heat, heat refuser. See, I understand that in an EV, but then you've got heated seats. Whereas, yeah. but in a car, which a byproduct of the engine is heat, it's sort of yes. just use the heat, right? And then crack a window what? for a bit of through air so it doesn't get too stuffy. What's the logic here? I don't know. I do not know. Does anybody know? Is, it, is he from an era when trying to run the heater too early would be robbing heat from the engine, which would be less efficient. You know, that's sort of an old um, water valve heater, maybe. But that I, still is a bit weird. I'm confused. I think that's weirder than my AC um, avoidance that scheme. That is weirder than your AC avoidance It yeah. is, isn't it? I was just going to read out another message from a patron, Laurie Huron, uh, who, because it sort of overlaps with what Vlad was talking about in a way. It's just... Um, he, uh, Laurie says, for some bizarre reason, possibly insurance related, whenever I go on a work trip, I have to book a higher car route rather than use my own vehicle. Uh, so he gets to drive lots of different cars. But what he's written about specifically is the Mitsubishi Outlander Fev. Okay. Um, yeah. Which is a pretty terrible car. Um, it's okay. And- it sounds like it's been chased by chaffinches when it goes by. I've said this before. As a pedestrian, you you got to listen to it. Oh yes. It honestly, it sounds like there's a it's bag of birds underneath. The bag of birds. <laughs> Excuse me, mate. You've got some birds stuck in your wheelbarrow. No, no. Yeah. Or um, or Mitsubishi on the on the on on the actual um, factory line. They fill the back bumper with with seed uh, mix, and they go, yeah. "Oh, this will learn them." So yeah. just a bit of. Trill, is it called trill? trill yeah, words? the birds will trill. come in and they'll and they'll start dining on it, and then the person goes and does the school run. So they're all a bit weirded out because they're inside the bumper, eating. Anyway, I'm um, going to stop talking. You carry on. Well, so what Laurie says he's got experience of um, of, of fev vehicles, mini uh, countrymen, and uh, and a Audi Q7. Um, and so he drove the Mitsubishi hire car and he said, what I hadn't realised about this FEV was that unlike the Mini, which had an electric motor powering the rear wheels and petrol pulling the front, and unlike the Q7, which has a petrol V6 and electric motor, all pushing power through the same gearbox to all four wheels, the Outlander FEV uses the electric motor as a generator in almost all circumstances, so the petrol engine doesn't actually drive the wheels. And this is true. This is the same as the original the uh, Chevy Volt. The Volt, yeah, the Volt. That's right. So he says, as a result, my trip consisted of the CVT box working to hold the revs at constant speed so the engine could power the battery, which in turn powered the wheels. Uh, there was a relentless loud drone noise. Like yeah, a diesel electric yeah. loco. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Now, because I, I remember this, because when the the Volt came out in America, in the American car media, there was a bit of, a bit of controversy slash controversy because... GM had initially said the petrol engine can't drive the wheels directly, and then it was discovered that it can in extreme circumstances, such as the battery being completely flat. So it sounds like the Outlander does the same thing, because Laurie says there was a very strange quirk. In the instrument cluster, there was a display showing the engine powering the battery and the battery powering the wheels with little green arrows. However, as the car hit 90 miles an hour, a new little yellow arrow appeared on the dash, <laughs> showing the petrol engine can also power the wheels. So if you're trying but to get a VMAX, 90 miles an hour above. you get this little winky arrow that goes, oh, you want that? Yeah. You want a bit of that, do you? You want a bit of that? Okay, come on. He says, quite how this feat has been achieved mechanically is beyond me, but it didn't half have an odd effect. If you put your foot flat to the floor and happen to touch 90, you suddenly got an almighty surge in the back as the 2.4 litre petrol engine and electric motor started working in tandem for the first time. Why on earth has it been designed like that? I Now, I drove that FEV, but I didn't, I realised I mustn't have gone over 90 because... Um, that's illegal lorry yeah um yeah lorry yeah it's I, I think it is just it's i presume it's because the electric motor is running out of puff yeah it must be that it must be that i don't i i'm get the, the reason why the vault um never drove the wheels with the engine i believe is because obviously that the idea was that it was um less uh parasitic losses from the 
the drive mm. the, you know from the engine and drivetrain and stuff it was just purely feeding the 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 motor to to feed the car but I, I, and it must have it must have worked because of the mpg that we were getting but mm. well, i got i, I um I love the expression parasitic losses. I do as well. I, I always sort of use it in my head when like we've got a jar of biscuits in the cupboard which are there mainly for the children but obviously it's impossible to ignore biscuits oh, so often I'll just losses, I'll, I'll, I'll have a few biscuits and then my wife will go how many biscuits have the kids been eating and I'll, I'll, I'll be like oh I don't know I think there might have been you know and in my head I'm thinking parasitic losses it just means that I've been scoffing all the biscuits it does it does out. yeah I feel for um, you I think that um well we've got a very short letter from a chap called Mark Sheridan um mm. and Mark Sheridan it goes back to again it's a conversation that I must have brought up I 100% agree with Johnny on the metallic black thing I changed my car last year after rebranding my company and I went for a black and gold theme in brackets free plug for JS security well done Mark I see what you've done there <laughs> I swapped my white Volvo V90 for a black one. The problem is Volvo do not do a solid black, just a metallic black, just like Johnny's wife's chimney. What a total ball ache it is to keep looking nice, especially for a work vehicle. Every minor flaw in the paint is exaggerated. Direct sunlight's the worst. It doesn't look all that great. Um, but I think that mostly the main dealer's fault was when they made a pig's ass of applying the super guard treatment. It's now going to have a full machine polish when I have the time. Best oh. mark. See, there we go. See, metallic black's not cool. It's it's a it's an answer to a question nobody asked. I said earlier on that you don't get people called Sandy anymore. What you do get, and what happened the other day, is Sandy rain. What? And we had some Sandy rain, and our up, our metallic up, looks terrible. Oh, Sandy Rain. I thought you meant that was a sort of exotic dancer name. No, (laughs) I said Rain with bits of shit in it. Yes. Um, And it is is the natural nemesis of the metallic black car. It is. As I now realise. Anyway, um, we should bring this into land um, because we've made a sort of half-assed effort to read out some more readers' emails and messages and patrons. Messages will try again soon i mean if we're inundated next we, week we we will um, we will with things about um, people called sandy we'll, we'll devote the whole episode to them but let's hope it doesn't come to that i think um, in the meantime i think i'm I'm going we're gonna have a pair visit to ravine and latrine yeah yeah nice, i think it'd nice, be great still quite <laughs> still quite fancy morphine and so <laughs> morphine <laughs> <and> so <laughs> incredibly incredibly soporific what, wouldn't there be another one there, there must have been a, there must be another alternative alt version to uh what was the one you said cocaine and aeroplane <laughs> yeah i don't know the only other one i could think of was heroin and theremin where you just <laughs> just absolutely load it load it up on smack and then trying to play a bizarre musical instrument in a very sort of high way um what about warfarin and mandarin uh you got to learn <laughs> a chinese <laughs> language while spinning your blood. Whilst taking blood thinners <laughs> <laughs> it's I I do not imagine that would get very far on Dragon's Den. <laughs> sorry, sorry, I'm Duncan Banton. I don't want to know. I, what, so I'm at in, increased risk of having a stroke, but also I need to speak to some Chinese people. What's your target market here? I'm out. I'm out, I'm out. Right now, all right. Let's bring this Let's to the whole. Guys, um, look. Guys, look. This, here's guys. where I'm at. Here's where I'm at. I've got three things to tell you. They are one, Johnny has a solo YouTube channel. It's called The Take Slate Show, in which Johnny <laughs> travels the country in the dead of night, stealing tiles off roofs. Uh, this week, he's on top of a church in Litchfield. Um, if that doesn't take your fancy because it's entirely fictional, then why not try the very real Late Break Show, in which there's reviews of cars and uh, barn finds and car collections in car caves and I know. interviews, idle chats. And Allegro. People, and it's all there and it's all good. Allegro, um, Allegro. Project updates. Allegro, Allegro project update. Yes, that's well worth uh, some of your valuable time. Uh, the second thing I've got to tell you is I have various books out. One of them is called Steel Flies. It's a uh, spoof Cold War thriller. Um, and the third thing I've got to tell you is not so much a fact this week as a, a miss apprehension about something about the movie singing in the rain. Um, it's often said that uh, in order for the rain to read on camera when they were filming that famous sequence of dancing in the street with Gene Kelly doing his incredible dance routine that they put milk into the water 
Oh. Uh, but it's not true. According to Gene Kelly's la- uh, wife, uh, he, she said that uh, it's, it's a myth. They didn't put milk in the water. What they did is they just, uh, they just lit it. Yeah, they properly. backlit the rain to make it look like, exactly. uh, like an 80s music video. The rain is backlit and Gene Kelly is lit from the front so you can still see him. And that's how they did it. Yeah, but if you wanted to, you could just roost a tail a gallons of old milk into the air, into the studio, just if you <laughs> really that wanted would to. Smell. Oh, that God. would smell delightful. Yeah, that, I, that would be one of my worst one of my worst nightmares. Just old milk covering everything. Awful. I, Awful. I, yeah. Awful. I had a very stern word with my wife when we were away the other weekend because she was about to buy the children milkshake and allow them to drink it in the car. No. That's shut that shit right down. No, that's not cool. That's not cool no. under any circumstances. No. Exactly. no. Right then. Well, uh, thank you ever so much for listening. If you want to drop us a line about any of the old shite that we've talked about or anything else, in fact, it's hello at smithandsniff.com or if you're a patron, you can drop us a line through our Patreon. Um, we'll do this all again next week. Until then, thank you for listening. Goodbye. Bye bye. And other things. Things. As well as cars. Things. things. Cars and things with Johnny and Richard. Things. Cars and things. Cars and things.